Good evening and welcome to Law Talk, the show that brings you the law, the Constitution, and the events of the day to each of us and to you once a month. Tonight, I'm very fortunate. I have with us the Donald that's going to be my co-host, and we're going to cover some subjects that he has a very distinct opinion of. Good evening, Donald. How are you? Well, Jim, I really appreciate you inviting me on the show, and the tonight's show is going to be ooge, ooge. I mean, beautiful. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm looking forward to it. So what kind of subjects are we covering tonight? Well, you know, I was doing a little research, and I bumped into a letter from a, a Miguel Rodriguez. Who is Miguel Rodriguez? Uh, well, he was an assistant U.S. attorney with the Eastern District of California, and he worked on the Vince Foster case. Wait a minute. Vince Foster takes me back a long ways. We're talking about right after the Bill Clinton was elected president in 1992. Isn't that the Vince Foster you're talking well, about? Vince Foster actually worked with Bill when he was in Arkansas. Well, didn't he also work with Hillary at the Rose Law Firm? Certainly did, and he was uh, helped her out when she got in a little trouble over Whitewater. Wait a minute, Whitewater. What was that about? Whitewater was a cattle deal where Hillary put in some money and she had a hundred to one return on that. Wait a minute, that's a lot of head of cattle. How yeah, did that play that's, out? That's a lot of bull. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. So she did quite well. And that's kind of what brought her from rags to riches was the uh, the Whitewater uh, deal. And then uh, so Vince got her out of that one. And there was rumors that Vince and Hillary were 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 um, Panky -panky? romantically involved. Ooh. And uh, and then Vince became uh, Bill Clinton's uh, legal counsel, the president's lawyer, when Bill got elected. Well, I, I understand that he was working on the Presidential Blind Trust, which allegedly was for funds that were donated to Bill for his, his either his library. I understand they started fundraising effectively the day they went to office, and, and the Blind Trust was supposed to be to, to conglomerate those funds. And yeah, and also, you know, Hillary was very active in the White House, even as for First Lady, and she was involved in what they called Travelgate. Travelgate. Uh, isn't that the uh, isn't that the new airlines that you can fly to Bermuda for half price? No, that's not the Lolita Express. <laughs> the Lolita Express. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that it, was Bill and Jeffrey. It's right? too late on that okay. one. But you want to be make sure you get it on time because oh, you, you, you have eight, to be on time. Yeah, if you're not on time, if you're after it, yeah, it's too late. So <laughs> the main thing is that the the Travelgate and the Whitewater became uh, problems for Hillary, and so Vince was kind of concerned that. Um, everybody, all his clients, which were Bill and Clinton and various others, were perjuring themselves. So he was starting to get, he went to a psychiatrist, he was starting taking pills, and he was worried that he might get in trouble for subjoining perjury. Wait a minute. Uh, so you're telling me that there was somebody in the Clinton White House that actually had a conscience about perjury? Well, what happened was he started going to pieces and, uh, so he had a little accident. Well, what kind of accident would that be, Donald? Well, it was kind of like a hunting accident, in a uh, way. But it was kind of like two hunters shooting two from two different directions. Well, yeah. is that like a circular firing squad? <laughs> yeah, a little bit like that, triangular fire. So what happened, he had one bullet that went up through the back of his neck. Oh, that's odd. With a small caliber, probably a 22. That's odd. And then later on, he managed to shoot himself, maybe 45 minutes or an hour later, he managed to shoot himself by putting a pistol in his mouth and then blowing out a 38 kind of in the same direction and maybe trying to knock that 22 out. Oh, so let me let me get this right. By accident, yeah, it was he an must accident. have tripped while he was at the White House yeah, and shot accidentally himself he shot himself in the back of the neck with a 22. With a 22 too, right. And then he, after he decided that I have a sore neck, well, the so problem then he was, went out no, to the, blow the, the, the 22 out with a 38? Yeah, but the problem with the 38 wound is really didn't have much blood around it. And also, um, if you shot yourself in the mouth of the 38, you wouldn't find your you wouldn't find the 38 in your hand because the blast would take it out of your hand. Of course. And then there was no evidence of antimony or molybdenum or usually have as powder on that hand. Right. And then the photographs uh, for the autopsy was a little strange. And what what when you say a little strange, Donald, what are you talking about? Well, what was strange about it was that there was photographs of the front of the body, but there was no photographs of the back of the body. Well, if there's no photographs of the back of the body when there's an exit wound, maybe, and maybe an entrance wound, don't you think it would be logical to take pictures of the back? Well, what happened was, of course, in those days, it was before we had cell phones, 
and people would use a Polaroid if you're an investigator because then you know at that instance whether you got the shot. And then, of course, you shoot 35 millimeter, but you wouldn't be sure if that was going to come out. Right. So what the FBI said is that the 35 millimeters of the back of the body were overexposed or underexposed, and they couldn't tell anything. And then, the um, according to the deposition of the investigator who took the photos, he said he took photos of the front of the body, but he didn't take any photos of the back of the body because someone had taken the camera back to the truck, the Polaroid camera. Oh, I see. They, they took it back to the truck, so we're not going to take the important no, well, pictures. Yeah, he didn't want to go Why would you want to take more important yeah, pictures? Yeah, so, right? so basically that evidence never happened. And also, uh, Miguel Rodriguez, who wrote a, a resignation letter to Ken Starr in uh, January 17, 1995, said that the reporting agents were changing the story that the investigating agents had. And she said the area wasn't secured, so people could have come and gone even while the investigation was going on. And so the whole uh, site was compromised. Well, wait a minute. You would think that somebody that's that important, that was a counsel to the president, who worked in the Rose Law Firm with the president's wife, that was involved in the, blind, the presidential blind mm -hmm. trust for organizing the the finances of the president during his presidency, you think those, uh, you think a, a person that died under those, with that kind of background would actually have a little more important investigation than just we don't care who shows up at the site? Well, what's also interesting about it is, you know, it's kind of strange to have a hunting accident like that right near the White House in the park. Yeah, you, I wonder about that. It, it, well, wait a minute. With all the with all the anti the, the rhetoric on gun control, how is it that somebody that has two different bullet wounds with a gun that does may not have been the one that actually did it? Well, I think what happened here is that um, you know you can't be too careful with guns, and apparently this was a little. Careless, and not only did he shoot himself in the back of the head when he was alive, but apparently long after he's dead, he shot himself he in the shot mouth. He shot himself again in the mouth. <laughs> mouth you know, so well, you know, there's some a, people never learn. Well, they don't <laughs> learn. They didn't. Do it. He recognized even after death that he didn't do it right the first time. And so anyway, Miguel Rodriguez brought this up to Ken Starr, who was the independent uh, prosecutor, right? And Miguel got essentially fired or had forced to resign. And the story that the reporting agents put in. Is the story that that flew, and the investigators' uh, story kind of got buried here. Well, let's talk about. Let's fast forward this to the present. Is are there any other cases that are similar to this currently? Well, you'd be surprised. I'd be surprised. <laughs> John Ash, and John Ash is a fellow who's uh, worked with the UN. He, he worked out of a, I think, a, a small Caribbean island, and he was great friends with Hillary and, and Bill. And Bill, and also a good friend of the Chinese businessman Lap Seng. Lap Seng. How does would, that name mean anything? Was in getting um, indicted for bringing in $4.5 million uh, that he said was for Paul Grichaps. Was this another meeting in some yeah. coffee shop yeah. when the president was going to be elected? And so the, the allegations were that the Clintons took millions of dollars in bribes from the Red Chinese. Oh. And. Uh, Ash, John Ash, was set to testify a week ago, and two days before he was about to testify, uh, he had an accident. All right, an accident? What type of accident was that? Uh, well, apparently he dropped his barbell on his neck oh, and died. Oh, dropped his barbell on the neck when he's about to testify about the UN. Uh, and so, no, and no, it was, about, it was about the Clintons taking the, money the from Clintons the Chinese. taking money from the UN. Oh, well, no, no, from okay. the Chinese. And the, the UN, Chinese. the UNs were, were like the go-between. The go-between. Right. So that means the UN was to launder the money. Yeah, launder the money. Launder and the and money. And so there's kind of a similarity in there. First of all, a lot of, well, a lot of <laughs> Hillary's friends and lovers ends up taking it in the neck. Well, I yeah. wonder about that. Yeah. What, it, that would have been funny if he was barbelling behind the neck and he kind of uh, dropped it on the back of his neck. And Vince was, you know, about to have to testify before Congress again or in the process of being interrogated by Congress. And John Ash was about to be, uh, okay. you know, going well, to court. Well, I think we need to leave that alone, Donald. I think we have to move on to our next subject because I'm telling you, the next thing you're going to tell me is, is in this election, more people got the barbell assault. Yeah. So what, what's we, our next subject for tonight? Use a barbell, go to jail. Yeah, use a barbell, <laughs> go to jail. You know, we have to restrict, you know, the Second Amendment doesn't cover barbells. But anyway, what's right. our next subject tonight? Okay, well, this kind of has the same thing. This is about uh, the FBI um, scrubbed, uh, or the Justice Department uh, under Laura Lynch, uh, scrubbed the 
uh, transcripts of the Orlando terrorist Omar Mateen in his 911 call. Oh, in the Orlando massacre. Yes, this is one where he's talking about jihad right, and, and ISIS and ISIS and Muhammad and yeah, Allah. Yeah, so that but was. But then scrubbed. he called it all like he was a Christian. No, he no. Well, they, <laughs> he called, and I guess it was some kind of accident. Oh, it was an accident. Another that accident. He yeah. And so all those, the Justice Department scrubbed all the references to the 911 call. So we can't get our hands, just like we can't get our hands on those photographs of Vince Foster, and we can't get our hands on the what happened to the barbell. We also can't get our hands on the original audio of the 911 call. So well, you know for, what's uh, interesting? We for did, Martina. It, there was, it, the original audio was released the first, it was released initially, so everyone could see the news, right? But as soon as the Department of Justice came in, everything was shut gone. It was down. Gone. It was all gone, all and, gone. Sorry, not here. Keep moving along. There's nothing to look at. And also, Mateen's domicile, his house or apartment, that was also scrubbed. According to the um, Palm Beach Post, foreign reporters broke into the Orlando's uh, shooter, Mateen, ISIS shooter, Mateen's home and uh, burglarized it. And the police are treating that like a burglary. So a burglary. not only the 911 tapes got scrubbed, but the home got scrubbed as well. Well, um, what I understood when they first went into the home, that he had more weapons and he had he had a computer with ISIS things right. on it. He was, he was similar to San Bernardino, mm -hmm. radicalized under whatever condition, at least it appears to be. But then... It doesn't fit the dialogue well, of the administration, the does it? No, it's kind of funny that, you, that, you, that you bring up San Bernardino because that site was contaminated. Before the FBI finished their investigation of the San Bernardino shooter, shooter dozens of journalists from around the world where the landlord let them into the crime Again, scene. Into the crime scene, right? Wait a minute. Journalists from around, around the world. world. Yeah. Oh, okay, I so see. foreign journalists. Yeah, foreign <laughs> journalists. Went into the, the townhouse. And, Again. And for the residents of Saeed Rezin Farouk. So it sounds like if you have an Irish name like uh, hey, Omar John Mateen Doyle. or <laughs> Saeed Rezin Farouk, the FBI scrubs the crime scene pretty well, kind of like Vince Foster. Oh. But also, remember what happened to Vince Foster's office. Well, Vince, Fo well, not to go back to it, but I'm <laughs> going to tell you what happened to it. Even before he was reported dead, Hillary Clinton's chief of staff, Margaret Williams, Margaret Williams, mm -hmm. went in and took out boxes and boxes of evidence. And funny enough, just in case, yeah, just that's in, in case. case. He had an accident. But you know the real interesting part: late into the evening. There was a what they called a tech team. They were in there trying to break into his safe, and the next day the his safe was, was empty. empty. But there was still that little note at the bottom yeah. of the briefcase that Which said, "Didn't show up the first day, but it was there two days later." No, that showed up like a week later. It said, like, yeah. you know, the, "The public will never believe the well, innocence." Let's, let's jump forward because this sounds like the same kind of scrubbing. Okay, are you trying to tell me? That the guy in Orlando was actually just out for a walk with a dog when he decided to shoot some people? I remember that from Benghazi. Anyway, so Sia Razun Ferruk, the San Bernardino shooter who had his house scrubbed, but that uh, it was used both as a family home and as a bomb making fa factory. Yeah, well, so I guess I, if you know, the neighbors said they saw him making bombs. If you're with the Frocks, the family, yeah, the family that makes bombs you together know what? stays together. You yeah. can't buy it. You can't be anti-Islamic. Well, Heavens forbid. So yeah, if you see this guy if making bombs, if you see bomb, guys making okay. bombs, he's not. That's a car <laughs> alarm. And by the way, he has a lot of car alarms all lined well, up. I, I forgot. Like to, I, forgot to bring, I, I forgot to bring my clock. I yeah. forgot to bring my clock. But what about the duct tape? And you got them all wrapped up. So anyway, there's a lot of similarities because you have Orlando, 911 scrub, uh, the terrorist hideout scrub, San, Ar San Bernardino, the hideout scrub. Uh, you have Foster, Foster office scrub. You know, um, this just sounds like there's a, there's a record that's playing again. <laughs> it's the same kind of broken record. As but wait a minute, there's a little more to this. Do you know that? And the, then we have John Ash, who's about uh, to testify. And then John Ash. Who scrubbed himself with a barbell. He scrubbed himself with a barbell. On the neck. But uh, what I would like to think more, a little more about is, first of all, the people that lost their lives in Orlando and in San Bernardino. We all have to take great care on how we discuss that well, part I, of it. I think the way that they should handle is that Hillary made 25 million bucks on that deal from the Saudis. Right. She should have to um, 
you know, disgorge that $25 million and give it to the victims? Well, you know, that's an interesting question, but uh, what, what, what legal basis would you ask for that? Well, I think what you have is, you know, she got paid by the Saudis, and the Saudis believe that gays should get the death penalty, and they end up with a death penalty. So, you know, I think that's fair that the $25 million well, ought to go to the families. I, I, there's an interesting link to be drawn between A, B, C, and D, but what's really more concerning to me is that this entire event has gone off the front page. You can't even go find Orlando unless you look it up on the Internet. There's no newspaper, no television station. No one is even discussing this anymore because, once again, it doesn't fit the narrative that our government currently believes needs to be told well, to the, the public. Is, but Hillary wants to bring more Syrian, well, people with fake Syrian passports. That's, there we, are, we, we go. We are, There's we the narrative. That's a 500%. So we know that... We know that she took the $25 million in bribes from the Saudis and others who are well, Kuwait, jihad jihadists, right? Uh, Qatar, that are the, the whole gang, who are like United Emirates, uh, and then, Jews, yes. Christians, gays all get the death penalty or they get their heads chopped off Correct. or they're burned alive or, or they're put they in get cages. Say there's no way drown. Real, yeah. Okay. So those, those, she took the $25 million there, and in return, Everyone knows that ISIS has taken Syrian passport machinery. Correct. And they say that the Syrian passports look better, the fake ones look better than the real ones. Yeah, yeah. you know why that is? Is because the Syrians... It's all look, new. All, <laughs> everything's new. Yeah. So, so, I mean, and she wants to increase the amount of people. <laughs> I mean, they're not necessarily coming from Syria. They could be coming from anywhere. We don't know where they're coming from. But they're, Let's they have not a, forget that we don't know where they're yeah, coming we don't know, from. Yeah, we don't really know. And because, by the way, we're not going to Syria but to we do, But we do know that they're highly changed saboteurs and they're highly changed spies. And they, you know, they, they're good at weapons. They're good at bomb making. They're good at forgery. They're good at impersonating. They get through interrogations. Didn't this guy go through an FBI interrogation? Yes, he Mateen? did. And for four years, he was investigated. But yeah. the FBI said, keep walking. There's nothing here. Okay, so nothing the, here. He's uh, only behind Baghdadi. He's okay, only a well, nice uh, supporter. But, but the point, there's the, nothing but here. The he the only point, went to Saudi Arabia. Nothing here. But I mean, the point is, these spies and saboteur are highly skilled, highly intelligent, highly trained. And they can outwit the FBI like, oh, like a three-year-old, and they're good at making bombs and weapons. And you know what's? You know why they love it? They all vote Democratic. <laughs> That's well, why they love them. Well, the thing about it, people say, well, the, you know, why should you pick on the Syrians? I mean, you can just walk across the border anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Well, the, but, you know, <laughs> if you look back at some of the politics of where Hillary and our current president came from, it's back to the Alinsky politics of how you destroy America from within from within the structure. And they've done a very good job of getting into the structure and now bringing in third world terrorists doesn't surprise me as part of their game plan. And when you look at the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of millions they want to bring in, you only need four or five guys. Well, picture they're highly this. trained. Yeah, yeah, picture this. We bring in a, a one million, 10%? Yeah. Okay, so anyway, as we, as we talk about that at the end of this, what's our next segment? Well, finally, we're going to talk about a great vacation spot. If you're going to take the Lolita Express down there, and you can have a lot of fun. But like I said, you want to get to the airport early. It's too late. And uh, go on down with Bill Clinton to Venezuela. Venezuela. All right, that's, our, that's, our, that's a country that used to be one of the most wealthy, richest countries in South America until... Well, no, but the Chavez thing is, no, but they went down. Power. They went down the shining path of social the justice. The shining path. The shining path of social justice. Oh, social justice. And now that they've achieved social justice, because everybody has the same income level. Well, wait a minute. Everybody has the same income level. Does that mean it's a good income or a low income? They have essentially they no, have no income. income. <laughs> They're basically eating out of garbage cans. Yeah. <laughs> but wait a minute. What about all, all those oil reserves? Uh, well, they kind of squandered that, and those were all embezzled by the Marxist elite. So that's all probably in the Caymans or Switzerland or something. Or Luxembourg. in Switzerland. Yeah, Luxembourg Switzerland, or someplace. Yeah, it's yeah. a slush fund someplace. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it was probably part of a foundation. It's somewhere. part of the foundation. <laughs> well, it's the Lolita Foundation. The Lolita Foundation. And Bill and Hillary are part but of that. But anyway, one. yeah, that's a shining example, the shining path of social justice. Um, and so what happened there is that Chavez took over, and they rigged a few elections, which not unlike what goes on here. And, you know, by, you know, intimidating the opposition to such a point. You where, mean they, when they drop a barbell on their neck when they're <laughs> yeah, weightlifting in the morning, yeah, right. the opposition leader, oh, 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 
Oh, yeah, funny so enough, well, Chavez they, reelected. Yeah, well, they wiped out the newspapers and, yeah. you know, that part of the Congress, one thing or another. And so even though there was kind of a resurgent where they got the vote, uh, you know, there was massive protests against that vote. And so the, the kind of the Marxist mob but kind of they, pushed it around. You know. Okay, what did, when Chavez, Chavez used to be a colonel, isn't that correct? Yeah, I think so. I uh, he made he, himself a general afterwards, but he was um, colonel in the army. And he was the last, the last overthrow that when he when he stepped into power, and then he was democratically elected. And you know, our president really supported that. Well, I, think, I, think, I think it was unanimously elected. Yeah, I don't unanimously. Think it, it was kind of like the it's Soviets. Either you like, vote this way, <laughs> or, not, or you're not, not, not going to vote again. <laughs> yeah, right. But so anyway, I, go I ahead. think I think he did very well in the election. Um, but the point is, they use this. Uh, you know, that's a socialist utopia, where they use basically Obama and Hillary's policy, economic policies that we see. Which, well, 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 you see what you happen here is like, say, for instance, the, the Clintons took, say, maybe 60 million in bribes from the Chinese. In exchange for the last 20 years, uh, the Chinese have been taking about $400 billion of... In, That's not a bad bribe. $400 billion of uh, intellectual property. So over the last 20 years, so basically, you look at that $20 trillion debt, that's basically due to Hillary taking a $60 million bribe, and that's what the Chinese have cleaned up since they haven't paid us for IP. So when you look at that, uh, you know, the Marxist elite does very well, but the economy itself it suffers because you're usually, you know, giving you the advantage to a foreign well, nation. You know, the argument they use is they say because the low cost of oil, Venezuela is failing. Do you, is that where it's really at, the low cost of oil? <clears throat> well, I think that they can, they can price the oil any way they want to, uh, pretty much. I mean, it's a, it's a socialist controlled price Well, structure. I do know that they, they supplemented all gasoline, so gasoline right, right. was like 10 cents a gallon, right. and everyone thought, well, I can drive all over the place, but there's nowhere to drive because there's no food, no well, restaurants, no anything, and except for the, for the bourgeoisie. Well, the leader, you know, like I yeah. said, they've got their money in Luxembourg, Switzerland, or the Caymans, so they're doing fine. But yeah, your regular schmo, working schmoes, and it's, it's pretty much do eating out of government. they have jobs? No, the thing's pretty much collapsed. They're yeah. eating out of garbage. It's just rights in the street. And it's pretty much what we'll see here in five or ten years. If Under we could these do, kind of, if, these if you, kind of economic you, policies. You know, if you, if you let, you know, if you're losing a trillion or two a year, I, you know, we're pretty much down that road pretty quickly. Well, you know, I do know this, is that the Venezuela under Chavez but it is was one of the main cocaine transporting countries. But it is a utopia. It's a utopia. It's a socialist Especially utopia. Especially inside the government when yeah. you can lock the gates and you can say, it's my utopia. <laughs> so Venezuela is a shining example of the America. Um, the miracle, In the future. The mir miracle of uh, Soviet economics. You know, oh, and, well, and you social know, engineering. It's great. i got to tell you something. What can be done with I mean, Venezuela? When, when you look at, like, say, the Soviet Union and the, the economic miracle that achieved there, Cuba and how rich they are, and all the great things the socialists have done, it's just amazing that not everybody doesn't want to live in a socialist utopia. I, I just think we should all have <laughs> yeah. grocery stores with no food. We should <laughs> all have the, the vegetable department with nothing but empty well, blocks. Well, don't forget the Holodoma was Stalin starved 12 million or 11 million Ukrainians well, to better. death. Yeah, yeah. It's better because that way they don't suffer. Well, they're they no hungry anymore. Yeah, they're starting. Well, there's no more hunger because <laughs> I wiped it out. Or the 50 million out of the population, 200 million Mao of political prisoners, he liquidated well, or murdered. Well, you know yeah. why? It's because it makes the country stronger. Well, also, they were probably would have voted the wrong way. And see, so you don't want that. And if you're going to have a democracy, you want to make sure yeah, the only... they vote the right way. <laughs> the if only they people, don't vote the right way. And the only people you leave the, leave, to, leave alive are people who are going to vote for you. Well, then I have a question. Um, now that we're, we're our country's moving in that direction, and some, some shining examples are, of course, of the Affordable Care Act and the current economic mm -hmm. policies where... You leave the workforce, and boy, you're you've got a job. Oh, by the way, you're out of the workforce. But well, basically, you've got what you a job. have is you have you know, whatever. More and more people on food stamps. More and more people on the dole, to the point where you know you've got the mass. Most of the voting population depends on the government for the dole. But well, wait a minute, where's the desalination point? Uh, people that don't work versus the people that work. I, we there is a the, desalination. We, we, we passed that. It yeah, but, well, now we're, we're talking about, you use the global warming analogy for our economy. Well, the thing is, when you look at the global warming and other tragedies like, you know, inner ear wax buildup and stuff like that, I mean, it's, you know, that's a tragedy. I know those are real tragedies. Yeah, you're like global warming and your inner ear, air, oh you know, God. wax stuff. That's a terrible thing. But I think it's more of a problem when you have a guy making $90,000 a year as a coal miner and then you put him out of business, and then he's basically starts doing oxycotton, making 
nothing working on, living on twenty six hundred dollars of social well, security. Well, wait a minute, money. wait a minute. Uh, if I remember correctly, our uh, the Democratic uh, nominee for president has said, "I'm going to put them all out of business. All coal miners will so be out these, of business. Uh, all all, all of these them. guys making ninety thousand dollars a year are now on social security for twenty six hundred bucks a month. There you go. But see, that's a great lifestyle because so, you don't have to go to work and in so, the coal mine. And so that's kind of what what we've got here is you want to destroy anybody who can make a living. And so they're completely dependent on the government. Well, unfortunately, under this administration, the middle class is being eliminated at a high rate because you've got the excess well, wait a regulations. You're making, statutes. you're making as much as you were in 1945 or something. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the dollar only goes about one tenth of the, the the distance. I mean, I think our standard of living is like when we had horse and carriages. Oh and yeah. Well, out. you know what? Unfortunately, <laughs> the horse and carriage can't get me across town in time. But I'm just saying, no. I mean, I think we're making less than we did 18 years ago. Or, you know, as well, per, per hour. Yeah. Well, you know. So what the, the whole thing's kind of collapsing. Yeah. But wait a minute. Those are bad statistics, Donald. Yeah. Where did you get those statistics? There's none, none of that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, because we should be happy we're on the dole. We so should anyway, be happy we're on the dole. What about so, my food stamps? Where are my food stamps? I didn't well, get them those, this far. No, no, they're getting more and more of those out. So, yeah. yeah. And also, like I said, if you have trouble sleeping, you that's you can get aid to the totally disabled if you have trouble sleeping. Yeah. If you're hungry, you get this. You get Title V housing. So when you look at the, the working people who are working, uh, you know, lower paid jobs, you make more on the dole. Well, Donald, what's you your do. answer for all this? Well, I would say the first thing is you got to pe give people jobs, okay? And of course, if you take away people's jobs and you give them a little dole and you have people fighting over limited resources, you're going to have riot in the streets like we have now. Well, how are we going to make America great again, Donald? Well, I mean, first of all, you want to keep, you know, countries that are, that are take, eating our lunch from eating our lunch, like China, particularly stealing $400 billion a year of intellectual property, uh, we should stop that so people have some incentive to invent, right? And then also we should make it so you make more going to a job than being on the dole so people have some incentive to work. And then we should have schools that actually train people to be able to do jobs instead of just whining and going on the dole so you have some incentive to go to school. So there's basically no incentives to do anything now but take your Oxycontin and live on your Social Security and then break into your my neighbor's house and steal something. But you have the Internet. And you have TV. Yeah, the, yeah. You have cable TV. <laughs> you have Netflix. You have Hula. What's going to happen next? You're going to have all this entertainment. Why do you need to go to work? That's true. But, yeah, so I would say people having jobs, you know, because people who aren't working, they think it's kind of fun for the first couple of weeks. But generally, after two or three weeks, it gets pretty boring. It's pretty boring. And then they start doing drugs, and uh, they start gotta beating get, their wives. You got to kill that time. They start beating their wives. Uh, and yeah, what's, a, what's a good beating every now and then? They get the